Efficiency will only take you so far. To be truly effective, you need to start with your people. Smartsheet helps enterprises better align people and technology so they can move faster, drive innovation, and achieve more. Smartsheet, the platform for enterprise achievement. Learn more at smartsheet.com. Okay, I'd like you to paint a picture in your mind's eye. You're at the Winter Carnival. There's a carousel to your left going around and around. A rickety roller coaster zooms by overhead again and again. A juggler plays with three balls, drops one, picks it up and carries on. What if I told you that this whole scene was set not at the carnival, but in an office? When you look closely, you notice that each of the juggler's balls has a label. Work, family, and yeah, again, work. All those little games, the rigged Coke bottles and the 20-foot high basketball hoops and the giant teddy bears, they represent distractions from a particular reality. And that reality is that the cycle is perpetual. You get on the ride at 9am and off again around 5 but the hours in between are effectively devoid of true purpose or progress. This is how many people around the world feel about the workplace today. Are you one of them? Welcome back to the future of X. I'm Faye Schlesinger, Managing Editor of Aussie, and this season, in partnership with Smartsheet, we've explored how closely the future workplace will be tied to the future of technology. But as our jobs continue to evolve, thanks to AI, automation, machine learning, we'll explore how to get off of the carousel-like ride that is your career and on to a path towards finding that ever-elusive goal, meaning. Adam Grant is a psychologist, author and professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. He specialises in organisational psychology and his podcast, Work Life, was one of the most downloaded new shows of 2018. I think balance is a ridiculous metaphor because, you know, it sort of, it makes me think of a juggler who's throwing all these balls in the air and then saying, okay, I've got to make sure that I don't drop the ball at, you know, at work while I'm making sure that I'm taking care of my family. And then I also have my health and friends and it's, I don't think that anybody can achieve that kind of balance. You know, anybody who cares about multiple domains of their lives, which is all of us last time I checked, uh, is, is just finding that unrealistic. Grant says that instead of balance, what we should be looking for is rhythm. To say, look, you know, a given day is probably going to be very much out of balance. Uh, And that's okay. Right? You might have two days a week where you work 10 or 12 hours and you, don't, you feel like you don't get enough family time. But then you're going to have a couple more days that week where you don't work at all and you're completely focused on your family. And I think of that as a rhythm because you have different verses of a song that you're playing throughout the week. So it's in this rhythm that work and life may actually become less separated. And that's a good thing. I've been studying this most of my career as an organizational psychologist, and I found that the single biggest driver of meaning at work is the belief that your, your actions in your job have a positive impact on other people. And so one way to find meaning is to ask yourself, if my job didn't exist, who would be worse off? But for a large number of us across all kinds of professions, figuring out who we are actually helping is easier said than done. I think for a lot of people in a lot of industries, there's, uh, there's a, a meaning vacuum that exists because they don't ever really know who the clients or customers or end users are that are affected by their work. Right? If, if you're an engineer, you rarely get to meet the people who, who drive the cars that you built. Uh, or, you know, who used the software that you programmed. And I think that, that many, many people live a version of that. And in this meaning vacuum, opportunity lies. Motivation is about, it's about designing a meaningful job, uh, a challenging and interesting job, not about saying, let me, let me just dangle this carrot in front of you in the hopes that you, in your most basic, dehumanized, animalistic sense, will suddenly say, I'm going to work harder so that I get to eat the carrot. No, thank you. 
So how did we get here? Where have we gone wrong? And most importantly, what can we do to help fix it? Too often, you know, the first question we ask a kid is, what do you want to be when you grow up? What we really mean is, what kind of job do you want to do? David Price is a global thought leader, author and futurist at the Innovation Unit in London. When I was 17, I remember, no no one ever listens to the parents, but my my father said to me, "Um, I've only got one bit of advice for you. Just take the job that pays you the most money because you're going to hate work. So just take the job that's going to pay you the most money. And and thankfully, I didn't pay any attention to his advice. And I became a, a professional musician, which I never made any money, but I had a whale of a time. Price says young people today, however, are in a much different boat. 60% of of millennials choose an employer with a sense of purpose. 71% say that they need companies to do more to address global issues. A new report from Deloitte on global human capital trends confirms this shift. These days, companies are not just being judged by workers and potential workers for the quality of what they produce or their bottom line, but also for the impact they have on society. I mean, I always laugh with audiences and it's, you know, as someone who's studied improv and a lot of my trainers have too, whenever you tell a joke, there's truth and humor. So the louder people laugh, the truer the punchline is. Lisa Bedell is the CEO of Future Think, a consultancy based in New York that helps companies eliminate unnecessary busy work. And one of the jokes that I tell is, you know, no one gets up in the morning um, and says to their spouse, their partner or their friend when they get to work, man, today I am all about shareholder value. I'm just I'm so pumped about shareholder value. No one gives a crap. I mean, they do and they don't. Right. That's you didn't come to work at that company just because shareholder value. You came to work at a pharmaceutical company to save lives. You came to work um, at a training company to help people reach their potential. Which brings us back to Adam Grant and that quest for true meaning. A meaning, he says, cannot come from a paycheck alone. I don't think that pay is something you offer to motivate someone. I think it's something you offer to show people how valued they are. And so, you know, if I, if I were to talk to, to managers in the future about, about how to deal with incentives and compensation, I would say, look, pay people as a symbol of appreciation. And you motivate them by designing a meaningful job, by giving them the freedom to make choices about what they work on and who they work with and when and how they get it done. And if your employer just doesn't live up to that sense of purpose, it can be pretty disillusioning. Most of us leave the best parts of ourselves at home because we think that what we're doing at work isn't actually worth that much. You may remember Mark Stevenson. He's the author of An Optimist's Tour of the Future. He says that increasing employee satisfaction is not about more benefits or more perks. People who work for purposeful organisations, they enjoy and engage with their work, even if it's difficult. I mean, I'm futurist for Medicine Sans Frontieres or Doctors Without Borders um, in the UK. I mean, it's like, there's a disaster, go and save some people, put yourself in enormous danger, get paid very little. They're the most engaged, happy people I know, because their work has purpose and meaning. Doing good does not have to be limited to a company's mission statement. Its employees can also find other ways to give back. Crystal Morey is a researcher at Smartsheet, and she helped lead the company's first hack for good this year. There, some of the most sophisticated users of Smartsheet's organisation tool came together to help nonprofits solve some of the problems they face. When I started my career, I think I had a lot of folks that somewhat told me do your job and go home at the end of the day. And, you know, that doesn't work for me. Like, I want to do a job that that gives back, that fuels me as a human. All humans want to do good in this world. And they're looking for spaces to do good things. And for a long time, finding a space to do good was challenging. As a young professional, Maury actively sought out ways to volunteer. But all the while, she had to balance career and family too. I had to find an organization. I had to become an official volunteer. I had to schedule it around my current scheduling. And and then I had to physically show up and sort of be at the liberty of wherever they wanted to put me. Like, I could do it in, you know, do you need me to clean a road? Do you need me to 
you know, help out in an event or, you know, bus dishes. But some of those spaces now exist in the virtual world. Coders are volunteering to build apps for non-profits. Tutors are connecting with kids via Skype, sometimes on the other side of the world. Hello. Ciao, ciao. So technology is connecting people who want to help with people who need it. You can now volunteer without being seated next to somebody physically. And so the geographic barrier of volunteering can really be removed. Additionally, because we're working in an environment that's constantly updating in real and live time, I can volunteer for you on a time that works for me. Maybe that's at midnight. Like maybe I do my best work late at night. Like I can volunteer at a time that's going to work for my life. Our quest for meaning in our jobs goes beyond just volunteering or whether or not our career has purpose. It's something we deal with on a daily basis. And it's here that many people find a need for community. Interestingly, this community may not be with colleagues who sit next to us day in, day out. Adam Grant again. You know, the disintegration of, you know, of, of workplaces is just it's shattering a sense of belonging for a lot of people. I think it's a huge opportunity to say, what if your organization wasn't your community? What if instead your occupation or your profession was your community? And we already have good models for this. And so I think there's a possibility that in the not too distant future, we're going to start to see community at work reorganize away from organizations and toward this idea that I belong to a profession or a trade or, you know, an occupational group of people who, who share some values with me. So, for instance, if you are the only biology teacher at a small high school, you may find a stronger connection with other biology teachers at schools across the country than to the English teachers down the hall. And as schools and workplaces move into the digital realm, this community becomes global. One route to helping us free up our time for more meaningful tasks is, of course, tech, including AI and automation. Crystal Mori again. We're, what we're able to do now is to shift our thinking from what it is we're actually doing and are we doing it, sort of the cross T's and dot I's, like those are being taken care of and we're able to shift our thinking to what are we going to explore together. Um, what, what do we not yet know? Maury says we can develop technologies that amplify people at work rather than replace them. The ability to have AI take care of what it can and for me to use all my energy to exceed expectations in a way that is completely new and revolutionary, you know, that is what fuels me. Efficiency is great for saving money, but will only take you so far. To be truly effective as a business, you need to start with your people. Smartsheet aligns people and technology so they can plan, manage, and automate work. And stay focused on the big stuff, solving challenges and driving innovation. When everyone is working as one, they can move faster and achieve more. Maybe that's why Smartsheet is trusted by 90% of the Fortune 100. Smartsheet, the platform for enterprise achievement. Find out what you can achieve at Smartsheet.com. Even as technology empowers us to become more capable humans, it runs the risk of dehumanizing us as well. A chatbot, for example, that is now handling routine customer service queries comes with its own set of quite unintended consequences. Lisa Lotta Lingzo is the founding partner of Future Navigator, a think tank based in Copenhagen. We'll have chatbots soon talking to us, uh, coaching us, telling us what to do. Your next meeting is in 30 minutes. You will need to leave by 3.15 to make it on time. What is uh, intriguing me is what is going to do to you that you have chatbots standing everywhere listening to your needs. And then you talk to them and you say, I want this, I want that. And you become a kind of digital slave master. I've scheduled your dry cleaning, ordered dinner and sent a birthday gift to your boss. Lingzo worries that the power at our fingertips may go to our heads. I'm a little afraid that we might all become psychopaths if we have this feedback crisis surrounding ourselves with digital chatbots which are trying to please us all the time. You are absolutely right, Fiona. And I am sorry for not seeing your genius before. Your idea of a social platform for cats? A true winner. 
And as we grow more dependent on our interactions with chatbots like Alexa, we miss out on the thing that gives us meaning to begin with. Real human connection. And hugs. Real feedback. Human to human feedback is something else. So if I hug you, your happiness could go all the way to the ceiling. If I, uh, if I call you, still a little outswing on the happiness curve. If I meet you in virtual space or even if I ten- send you a text message, you don't at all get any vibration on this happiness curve. So what we need is some real physical interaction. Lingso's findings can be traced back to John Nesbitt's theory of high-tech, high-touch, which led her consultancy to offer a workshop on human interaction, including in the workplace. Lingzo says there's actually a perfect size group for working together. How many people? Well, that might depend on how many slices of pizza you eat. People need to work at much more local scale. So talk about having no more in an office than can share two pizzas, basically. You need to be able to look each other in the eye. You need to be able to give each other a pat on the shoulder. Because if you have more people than that, it's basically just noise. This kind of close human interaction will be harder to come by in future workplaces. But Lingzo says technology can help us get the next best thing. You will have virtual reality spaces. You will have holograms that you can touch and feel. They will actually give you haptic feedback. So when we are done with this uh, podcast, we'll be able to give each other a hug or we think we give each other a hug and we get this sensation. So what else can we do to get those sensations more integrated in our day-to-day? It goes back to Adam Grant's concept of work-life rhythm, as opposed to our nine-to-five schedule. Though in some cases, that's sadly more like five to nine. I'd definitely say to the managers of the future that the the five-day work week and the nine-to-five work day are arbitrary conventions. You know, those are norms that were invented by a group of people at a particular point in time. Uh, I think largely in the Industrial Revolution. And I don't think those norms make sense anymore. Uh, We've already seen a few companies like uh, like Microsoft in Japan, like uh, Perpetual Guardian in New Zealand, uh, experiment with with a four-day work week and discover that not only did productivity go up, but costs went down. Uh, I've also seen some organizations move to a six-hour workday. And I'm pretty confident you know, from all the evidence I've read as an organizational psychologist that you can get more done in six focused hours a day than in eight unfocused hours. Mark Stevenson. You know, I think we've got the whole, this is what you do, this is how you do it, here are the rules of the game, and then you have to stop on this date. It's kind of ridiculous. It's very unhuman. It's, you know, it's the way a machine would design the workplace, but it's not the way you or I would do it. It isn't, is it? And it's quite a scary thought. Really, it's as if the machines have effectively been designing our organisations for a long while, even when they haven't. Maybe now is the time to break free of regimented hours, both day-to-day and when it comes to retirement, and other antiquated practices that have taken hold in the workplace. If that's the case, it's not going to come from a robot revolution, but from a human one. Lisa Bedell. I don't think people believe that they can affect change as much as they can. (laughs) In reality, you know, people think the future is a straight line, like we're going from point A to point B, when in fact there are many possible futures. And being open to change, learning how to adapt to new circumstances and how to make them better, that's all, well, very human. You know, you can be more in command of your future than you think. Um, You want to be proactive about it um, and be anticipatory of what outcomes could happen with different trends rather than having um, someone else determine your future for you and having to react to it. So that's a long way of saying you have a lot more control over it than you think. You just have to be open to the possible changes that come with it. So each of us can be a futurist too. We can keep our finger on the pulse of change and come up with potential, likely and ideal scenarios for our own lives ahead. The key thing to take away from this is the future's bright, the future's more flexible, but it's that human element of getting comfortable with change that will allow us to get there faster. 
You've been listening to The Future of X. We are in a seismic change in the workforce. And here's what we've learned about the future of the workplace, from creativity and collaboration to gamification and networking. 10 to 15 percent of the folks that will be managing organizations will not be human. Gamification will become intrinsic to the way we work. For me, creativity is also being lazy. (laughs) It's also being irritated. It's also being curious. It's basically being all the stuff that machines are not. The Future of X is produced by Aussie in partnership with Smartsheet. I'm your host, Aussie's managing editor and future team hunter, Faye Schlesinger. Derek Clements is our producer, editor and future Fortnight specialist. Sean Braswell is our lead writer and future reincarnated chatbot. Our editorial producers are Anna Davies, future head of customer experience, and Shannon Williamson, future futurist. Rob Kulos is our executive producer and future digital overlord. And Tracy Moran serves as deputy editor as well as our future project manager. Which is a good thing, don't forget. Special thanks to all our guests this season, as well as Christian Austin, Samantha Levy, Mark Sanders, Carly Stern, John Kors, and Nick Massidi. For our final future tip of the year, we'll leave you with this. Get off the carousel. You heard me. Turn in your tokens, Buster. The ride stops here. Before another repetitive day of to-do lists and back-to-back meetings, ask yourself what you do best. And then figure out how to use that to help other people, whether as a career switcher or through volunteering. We've put some links up for some of our favourite ways to volunteer using the skills you're passionate about at aussie.com future. Soup kitchens remain incredibly important, but there is much other work to be done. Maybe it's coding, maybe it's video production, maybe it's even hosting a podcast. Learn more at aussie.com slash future. That's ozy.com forward slash future. If you've loved this series, check out more Aussie podcasts. There's The Thread, our Webby-nominated show connecting surprising moments in history, and Aussie Confidential, true stories from the dark side. Or listen to Briefly, for smart global news every day in seven minutes flat. Find them all at ozy.com slash podcasts or wherever you listen.